The uh, hour of 12.45 having arrived, I'm going to call to order the Greater Minnesota Jobs Economic Development Finance Division and welcome everyone to the committee. I'm going to go through uh, what are the non-formal rules. There will be no formal posted rules, um, but the non-formal rules are this. We will start on time. We will not pass any bill out of this committee unless it is in shape for the next committee or the floor. So I'm going to warn members now, if you have a bill or an amendment and you say we'll fix it in the next committee, we will lay the bill or the amendment over until you decide how it can be fixed in this committee. But no bill is leaving this committee in anything other than the shape it needs to be for the floor or the next committee. I would request members not bring food to the committee. We don't need to have treats. We don't need to eat in front of the public. If you need something to drink, it's fully understandable. I, that's fine, bring that. But we don't need to eat. Particularly on television, it is extremely annoying watching someone fill their mouth while another member or the public is trying to testify. So those are the simplistic rules, and I will add this one. The other rules will be defined operatively during the course of the session. So if something comes up, we'll handle it. We'll handle it in committee. We will try to treat everyone fairly. We don't need to have an argument here. I'm fully capable of recessing the committee or adjourning so we can settle our differences and then come back and make sure the public understands where we're going to go. So with that, the chair is doing the first presentation. My vice chair is not here, so Representative Poppy, you're going to get the gavel because the vice chair isn't here. Bring on this. She's coming over. Madam Chair, members of the committee, one of the charges of this committee was to reinvent one of the things that we had, to, oh, the Vice Chair finally is here. Uh, I just announced, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, that we do start on time, and I had to turn the gavel over to Representative Poppy because the Vice Chair was not present. So in future, I may need you. On I time. apologize, Mr. Chair, I had a local issue. I was Pol apologies out. accepted, the weather is, of course, extreme. Uh, one of the charges of this committee was to reinvent something that existed for approximately a decade in the Minnesota House, the mini-session. The mini-sessions went from 1987 to 1997. There were 14 of them. They lasted approximately three days all around the state and in the metropolitan area, and you'll see what's going to happen. So I'm going to go over a history of the mini-sessions. This will be posted on our website for you to review, and it is a work in progress. Now, the chair created this, so the chair takes full responsibility for any error, and I know there's one spelling error in your packet, but we did catch it, and it's corrected on the presentation. So if you look at your presentation, this is probably the coldest day of the year, so we're going to start with sweaters. The Winona mini session had sweaters for house members and hosts. And you can take a look at them. They were produced by Winona Knits, black sweaters for members, white sweaters for hosts. And these sweaters were worn during the three days. Now, Bill Marks is not here. Bill Marks is from Winona. Bill Marks was part of the mini session that was held in Winona. Bill Marks still has his white sweater. You also see the banner that is there one of the other charges of this committee is to link these mini sessions with the possibility of the governor having his state of the states again outside of St. Paul. Winona was the first community in the history of the state to have a state of the state outside of St. Paul. And we can, we'll talk about the political ramifications of this, but there were some other ramifications that are much more substantive than that. So if you take a look, you can see the banner, you can see the sweaters, and you can be warm by those sweaters uh, by just looking at them. <laughs> so these are the 14 mini sessions. Now, each of the mini sessions has a session report, 
which I researched, and I want to thank the Legislative Reference Library and House Research. You will see links to these in this presentation. Now, if any of you represent any of these areas, I would highly suggest you go back and you take a look at the issues that were displayed during those mini sessions over that decade, because some of those issues are still yet to be resolved. Now, this is a blow up of the mini sessions. The first one was in Mankato, and John Dorn was the representative, and I room with John Dorn for 20 years. I'm not going to go into the stories of John Dorn and I rooming together, other than to say he was one of the most economical individuals I have ever met, even to the point of stealing every other one of my shower curtain hangers because he forgot to bring his own. So, the Mankato mini session, and you can see here, this is a highlight of the Mankato mini session. You can see Paul Sertfenick. Some of you know Paul Sertfenick. If you're on higher ed, Paul Sertfenick now is with the Minnesota Private College Council. Paul Sertfenick worked for the Speaker of the House, Bob Vanasek. So you see Bob Vanasek there, Paul Sertfenick, and there's another fellow next to him that you might recognize from an earlier time. And they're looking at a painting on a grain elevator in I think this is Thunder uh, in, in near Mankato, and we're all glancing at it. So these legislative reports are interesting because we did go out literally everywhere. So the committees that went out, and we had maybe a dozen to 15 and 100 members, fanned out across the entire area for three days. These are the links, and these links will be active once we post it on my website, so you can go and take a look at these particular legislative reports and see what happened in your area. Now, this is what happened in Winona. And I'm going to be very partisan here in promoting Winona products. So here's a Winona company, Wincraft. And if you don't know what Wincraft does, if you watch the Super Bowl, all of the pennants, all of the material for the Super Bowl, for the Ryder Cup, for any national sporting events is produced usually in Winona. They produced a little keychain, which you see here. You also notice that the paper had an outline of all of the hearings over the three days. And I want to stress at the bottom, Preston, Lanesboro, and Byron. They were in Virgil Johnson's district. So this isn't just a DFL or a Republican mini session. It went everywhere, and we have the Rochester representative who just arrived. This was a four-day mini-session, three days in our area, and then one day in Rochester. And you can thank Dave Bishop for that one. Now, the items that were used to promote the mini-sessions were varied. Here, too. Note the turtle. The turtle is a Native American pipestone turtle. It's approximately this size, and the sticker at the bottom is there. This was in Worthington. It was put by our dinner plates for dinner. The dinner was sort of dark, and people saw the turtle, and they thought it was chocolate. And they were picking it up and biting into the pipestone turtle. And an announcement had to be made, don't bite into the pipestone turtle. So this is an FYI, if we do reinvent these, Let's make sure we distinguish between chocolate and pipestone for future mini sessions. The other is a rather remarkable frog. This is a tree frog, this is the actual size, and note the company that did it. This company still exists. If you watch the Discovery Channel or if you watch National Geographic, this is the company that recreates all of those marvelous nature things from past and present, and they had created this, and note that while we did get the state money for this, the congressional earmark didn't happen, so we can blame Congress for not having this particular item. The next are a series of articles from the paper, and here it says nearly 100 of the House's 134 members are expected for the mini-session. We're hoping the mini-session will be very helpful, House Majority Leader Bob Anasik said in setting the agenda for the 1990 legislative session. And I noticed some of you, 1990 might as well be 1066 or some other arbitrary date, but it isn't that long ago, and as you see, the results of the mini-session still exist. Bob Vanasek here is a House Majority Leader. You'll see he'll soon become Speaker. 
the sites for the legislative session, and this is where it becomes political, and I know it's misspelled on your handout, but I corrected it here. Uh, sites for the legislative mini sessions are selected mainly for political fortification according to an independent Republican lawmaker who asked not to be identified. The legislature, who noted that the mini sessions are very expensive, added, however, that his party would probably use them the same way if they were in control. The intent of this is not to be partisan. The intent of this is to take the committees out and spread out in an area where we can understand fully from both sides of the aisle what the issues are in that area. And as you saw in Winona and as we saw in the other areas, we did that and we continued to do that. So we can play partisan games with it and that goes back you know, 30 years too, but I would hope we would not. The impact of these is huge. You can see here, we're looking at an aviation product. One of the big strengths of having the mini session is being able to go on site and see exactly what we're passing legislation for. And in this case, the Technical College wanted an aviation center because aviation was all the rage uh, during the 1989 mini session. And here is one that's made out of metal and composites. And as you'll see, composites will become very important in both the mini session and in the state of the state. So here, we keep surprising ourselves with the success of every mini session. This was certainly the smoothest functioning session ever, said House Speaker Bob Vanasek. Now, he probably said that at every mini session, but it only counts if he says it in your district. <coughs> so, again, there was competition between these areas on how to have the best mini session. Here's another one. Take a legislator to dinner. We actually had legislators go into people's homes for dinner. Now, this is a cautionary tale. We had some members who we knew had colorful language who were told that if they went to dinner, particularly in a home with small children, we expected them not to use the colorful language when they were in the person's home. But notice the other comment. The exposure to Monona is phenomenal. For southeastern Minnesota to have a vision and an opportunity for business and government to share their ideas and concerns with legislators is phenomenal. I think in back of me, is the lobbyist for the Chamber of Commerce. Notice Chamber of Commerce. If, if you don't know who that is, he used to be a staffer here, and now he works for the Chamber. Tom Turville, Winona Chamber of Commerce. I'm gonna talk a little bit of how these were set up. I co-chaired the Winona mini session with Gary Evans, who was a vice president at Winona State. But the Chamber, the city, the county, were all involved in setting this thing up. It took us four months to set it up, to make sure we were ready to go when the legislators arrived and we had places for everybody to stay and committee hearings and we had committee hearings of substance. So I'm going to emphasize here that things like the chamber should be used if we're having mini sessions in the future. Notice the other. The local cost here was about $3,000 to $4,000. Now this is again 30 years ago, but there are some costs to the local community for this. And we'll talk about house costs soon. So on the next slide, and I'm glad the Rochester rep is here. One of the most interesting hearings was in Rochester on a new state flag. Now the two state flags you see there are actually mine. They wanted me to carry the bill. If there's time in committee, I could explain to you why I did not carry the bill. But Representative Gutnick from Rochester did. And this is still an issue, changing Minnesota's state flag. So the first state flag was rejected for a lot of reasons. And then they came up with the second. And the second was the one that was actually heard in Rochester. So if you go to the next slide, you can see that the second um, slide has the hearing and you have the former state rep, John Anderson. You can see, I think that's Abrams in the background and Gil Gutnick was the one presenting the bill. Also notice that the Winona model legislature this year in 2018 took up the flag bill and a student from Rochester or from Rushford Peterson took up the bill and got it as far as the education committee where it died, went through taxes and it went through environment and ag. Uh, but it didn't make it out of education. 
So this is an issue that's still with us. It might come up in a mini session. And I bring it up here, and I did, if you don't know what the Monona mini session is, I think we have some bill books that were passed out to members. You can take a look at what the mini session is. There's the thank you that was in the paper, and we want to remind members to thank everyone that attends. Also notice I did a little column here, and then I asked for feedback, and of course one of our <laughs> constituents said the legislators should take us to dinner. So that's another option. Instead of us inviting you know, legislators into homes, we should be taking them to dinner. Well, you can debate that on your own. Uh, the results. Here you see Governor Perpich in Winona signing the 1990 bonding bill. The 1990 bonding bill will have in it the purchase of Lord's Hall from what was the old St. Teresa campus and it will become the first residency college and still the only residency college inside what was the state university system, then the Minsk system, now the Minsk state system. This became a cash cow for Winona State. And if you don't know what a residency college is, the students live in a facility where they not only have dorm rooms, but they also take their classes. This was an experiment by President Kruger, and it turned out to be a very profitable. Notice Dave Bishop is there because there were a few little items for Rochester that were also there at the time. Uh, this I just acquired. Now I know it's difficult to read and you can read it at your leisure, but we were searching for a cost to a mini session. Now we saw the local cost at $3,000 to $4,000 for Winona. These articles have our first look at what the house cost. And apparently, one of these mini sessions in 1995 cost about $50,000. So this is not an inexpensive item. And I suspect that some of our committee budgets, including this one, will be used to support mini sessions should we go out. So this is for reading later. I, in fact, I just got this Monday, so I, this was incorporated relatively late. The next thing we're going to talk about are the state of the states. The first state of the state, as you can see at the bottom, was on February 9th, 1988, in Winona. It was Governor Perpich coming to Winona for economic development. And of course, that's the name of this committee, economic development. That's how we tie all this together. By the way, there is a high stakes test on this later. It'll be in November of next year, and it's called your reelection. So listen closely. Now, I have two graphics. I have a graphic for Winona, and I have one for Rochester because the state of the states that I'm gonna focus on had a huge impact on these two communities. So if we go to the next slide, this is a paper I did based on my journal. Some of you have wondered what that journal is good for. Oh, it's good for so many things you really don't know. So the journal is a day-by-day, -day, literally, examination of the process of what happened when Governor Perpich proposed a composite engineering program for Winona State. The bill, as it went through the Minnesota House and Senate, signed by the governor, and then the subsequent state of the state where the governor came down to announce not only the bill, but there would be a facility and there would be other add-ons to what was happening. So this paper I did in 1992, which of course would be a couple of years afterwards, and you can see at the bottom, this started when Perpich visited Winona on a campaign swing in 1986. He went to Pasture Hall and he saw what was happening with composites. Now I should, Madam Chair, ask this question of our STEAM group, because I know they're very sharp. What is a composite material? I believe uh, Representative Liz Lagarde has an answer to that question. I think I do, Madam Chair. Um, I believe it's when you compress different types of material together and it goes through a process and it's heated and then it comes off the other side. Madam Chair, Blowski. he's close. A composite material is that, but it's also much more than that. Uh, Winona is considered to be the home of the first practical use of carbon fiber impregnated in a resin to replace metal materials. You have cars today that are primarily composite materials on the inside. 
If you swing a golf club, you swing composite material. If you swing a racket, you swing composite material. All of the items that you see here, including this iPad, are made from composite materials. There were five companies in our area that had some type of composite component, and they worked with Pasture Hall on developing a type of technique that they could test their materials per pitch sod. He said, what you need is an undergraduate composite engineering program, and that's what this story is about. So he proposed it. It became a bill going to Capitol Hill, both in the House and Senate. It was just one bill carried by myself and Senator Morris, and it was backed up by material from Winona State, and you can see the first one here, the analysis of the impact of composite science. Then you can see the second, and you actually have a little carbon fiber material here in the first page. The bill was the first time in the history of the legislature that a multimedia presentation was done. This is the Pulowski Journal again. This is January 14th, 1987. These are notes from my journal where we began to field test that multimedia presentation. And if you notice, the multimedia presentation was produced by MediaWorks in Minota at a cost of $20,000. Now, this is 1987. That is $1,000 a minute. Multimedia in 1987 was six stacked slide projectors in a stainless steel container with different motors, and they worked in sequence, driven by music, and it was sort of the Ken Burns effect, where you took still pictures, but because you're moving with six, it gave the impression of movement. But no one had ever seen anything like it. It was called the Age of Composites, and I have three sections here, and it became our basic tool for lobbying for the composite engineering. Now, I have a small, I have it here, I'm not going to show you the 20 minutes, but I am going to show you at least the beginning so you get a flavor for it, and I have to use the mic because our archaic system here cannot link the sound from a new iPad 3 2018 to its system, so I have to take the mic, which by the way is composite, composite, and turn it. The ages of man are named by the materials that shape their technologies, stone, bronze, and iron. The evolution continues as materials make the decisive difference as our civilization advances. Enter the age of composites. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept. One we are unwilling to postpone and one we intend to win, and the others too. This is a story of research, development, invention, risk, and high performance. It is the story of advanced composites in Minnesota, with chapters in medicine, transportation, recreation, and aerospace. In fact, a chapter for nearly every United States space endeavor. Listen, uh... Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. So there has not been a space flight then or now that does not launch with a significant percentage of the material in that space vehicle sourced from Winona, Minnesota. Now either the materials that are put into it or the final product are produced in southeastern Minnesota in some area. So with that, I'm going to go to a simpler material. We had the multimedia. Then we came across this, an ice fishing rod. Diversified Fabricators was producing composite ice fishing rods. 250 of these were purchased and donated and then given to the legislators. Dwayne Benson just passed away, and Dwayne Benson came in my office and said, can I, can I have two? I'd like one for myself and one for my son. So he took two, 
And then when the bill was presented in the Senate, they had already used them. And he explained to the Senate committee how many fish that he and his son caught with the composite ice fishing rods. So never underestimate a small lobbying tool. Works well, practical. Now, that was diversified fabricators. That was Stan Prozen. Stan Prozen is considered the first individual in the United States in the world to take carbon fiber, impregnate it with a resin, and create a six inch test ring that used to be metal and then test the components. So Stan had diversified fabricators. Now all of these composite companies have changed. His company now is Coda Bow. So if you are a musician and you play a fiddle, you play a cello, you play any stringed instrument, this is considered to be the bow made out of composite materials. Now Stan has since passed away. He was, by the way, a very good golfer. But that is a story for another day. Um, but these companies aren't the same as they were 30 years ago because the materials aren't the same. And we can thank the Winona State Composite Engineering Program for the evolution of some of these companies. So here is the governor in Winona signing yet another bonding bill. And notice it's 1987, and there is the actual bill. And signed on the bill are the conference committee members. Lynn Carlson is one of them uh, on the composite engineering. And Winona, had, Winona was the fourth of the engineering schools in the state university system. There were only going to be three. So Winona had to donate, had to find a million dollars, which they did, to come up to support the school. Now, the discussion from 1987 to 1988 was how is the governor going to promote this once the bill signed? This is how he promoted it. He came to Winona, he had the state of the state, and it was held on February 9th, 1988. And you may say, well, how do I remember that date? It happened to be Representative Gene Pulowski's birthday. And if you remember my speech on the House floor about Tom Rukavina and the letters, my father also wrote the governor, told the governor it was my birthday. So this is the front page of the Winona Daily News declaring it Gene Pulowski Day. So if you want to work that in to a state of the state or a mini session, we can probably do it. But also notice that the speech is all about economic development. And Perpich now is going to push not just for composite engineering, he wants an engineering building. So the results, I've sort of stationed these this way. If it's got the button, it's the state of the state. If it's got the little keychain, it's the uh, mini session. But number one, WSU undergraduate composite engineering, which is still there and is still the only undergraduate composite engineering program in the country. Number two, a new building, which is now Star Hall, but it was the Applied Health and Science Building for Nursing and Composites. Number three, a new aviation center for the Technical College. Number four, planning for the WSU library, which would be the first digital library in which when it was built would be the most expensive building at the time built by the state university system. The overpass of the Winona Railroad tracks, which would take state money, federal money, and local money to build, but the discussion was held during the mini session. And the acquisition of Lords Hall as the only residency college in the state university system. So those are the results of the state of the state in the mini session just for Winona. So the next one, Rochester. Rochester had a state of the state, and you can see it in 2005 when Tim Pawlenty came down. Tim Pawlenty would announce that he would support a branch of the University of Minnesota in Rochester. He then established a committee to study it, and it became the Rochester branch of the University of Minnesota. This is a significant educational addition to the university and to southeastern Minnesota, and it wouldn't have happened without the state of the state. So with that, members, if you wonder where these come from, these, this is how I taught my high school classes and my college classes. These are an array of different courses I've created, and all of these are now presented to the public in various ways. So if you're wondering when the next one is, notice that we have the French Revolution and Napoleon. That's being presented next month 
at Castle Rock Museum and Album. This is the third time I presented it. Uh, this contains music, art, uh, architecture, and literature from the era of Napoleon and the French Revolution, but you can see the rest. Probably the one you're most interested in and took three years to create is the entire history of the renovation of the Capitol. This took three years, and I used the 3,000 high-res pictures from Tom Olmscheid, and I pulled about 700 of them out. But it has the entire restoration of the Capitol from the ground all the way to the top. So with that, members, I'm open to questions. Um, and then there is a high-stakes quiz <laughs> next November. Yes. Representative. Yeah, yeah Madam Chair and uh, Representative, or Chair Pulowski. Um, I'm really interested in this because uh, I'm one of the older members that doesn't think 1990 was very long ago. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm just wondering how this relates to um, Governor Perpich's uh, capital for a day. Um, I was president of the Grand Rapids Area Chamber of Commerce, and I think it was 1990, um, that he had a series of capital for the day events and just like what you're talking about here, many sessions, the communities came together. In our case, it was the Northern Minnesota Citizens League, Chamber of Commerce, and others. And we created our own agenda. Yep. And based on that agenda, um, commissioners were assigned to visit. I don't remember legislative hearings so much as I remember commissioners coming out and looking, the, the commissioner of transportation and so on. And it was fabulous. And then um, it was a, you know, like an overnight. And at the end of a really comprehensive day that had been well planned, the governor spoke and kind of wrapped everything up. And initiatives really took off after that. I've always thought the capital for a day was a wonderful uh, initiative. Is, do you, yeah, Madam Chair, Representative, capital for a day is different than the state of the state. Uh, governor Plenty also had capital for the day, and I think he had five of them. And Winona was one of the cities in 2007 that had capital for a day. Uh, and it, it, it's a different venue than what I've described for you here. The state of the state takes a great deal of planning. Uh, the capital for the day did not take as much planning. The mini sessions take even more planning. Uh, the logistics of a mini session is something to see. So capital for the day is, is another way of doing this, but it's a, I'd say it's a much lighter experience than the two I've described for you here. Representative Lehman, any update? Um, th uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Pulaski. As I recall, it took a lot of planning. I, 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 I was in uh, the Plenty administration when he went to Rochester. I was there and so on. That was, you know, state of the state. But this capital for a day, um, it was like a month of and more of planning. And it really, I, I liked it because it was from the ground up. It was, it was very grassroots and very similar to, I think, what you're talking about here. So... The it's, it's it's something to, I, I've been waiting to see it resurrected <laughs> by a future administration. Well, well, Madam Chair, State of the State is a presentation to the entire state, but it's at a location outside of St. Paul of what the governor is proposing to the legislature. Whereas a capital for the day is a, is a different presentation altogether, and I've been part of all of them. So I'm, I, I like all three. I wish they would do more. And I think we need to get out. We need to get out into areas outside of St. Paul and listen more and then be on site more. It's, it's a great deal of difference when you're on site and when you're listening to people, people who would never travel here to testify, but who you might eat dinner with in their home. I agree. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Any other questions or comments? Representative Souk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to invite um, Representative Plowski to see if he can focus himself toward how do communities and or their um, representatives and possibly even the administration to find elements of focus that are going to have a little bit of legs into the future, are going to have significance so that they do have the ability to be leveraged? Representative Plowski. Yeah. Madam Chair, that was the whole purpose of these, that you would plan in advance what might be legislative proposals and that you would work toward 
explaining those at the local level. Now, we had one advantage with Perpich in that he had already proposed a composite engineering. You had one advantage because he was proposing the Rochester branch of the University of Minnesota. But you saw there were other elements here, too, some of them transportation, the overpass of the railroad tracks. Uh, all of these things need to be planned in advance, and only your communities know what they are. And then you're going to have to work with the House to make sure that the committees on site hear those, visit those, and understand those. So this is a process that starts four or five months in advance, and it's going to have to be worked out. Mm -hmm. And believe me, there were a lot of community meetings and a lot of input before the hearings were held. Much more planning than to some of the hearings that are held here. But that's just a comment on my part. Representative Pulowski, the fact that you are presenting this to this committee today, does that tell us that we are going to be um, the committee that's going to help to facilitate and create the next generation of Madam Chair, I'm glad you asked that because I'm looking at the members, the staff members on either side. We've already had this conversation in my office. No one committee of the Minnesota House can organize this. This is going to take leadership and its staff to organize it, and then it's going to take all of our committees to work with leadership and the community to understand how we're going to do this on site. And we literally went through each of the committees and where they would be, what they would be doing, and how it's going to link to a legislative agenda when they hit the road in our area. And each one got a little bit better. The Mankato one started it, and it was excellent. But once, you, once staff gets the feel for this, and once members get the feel for it, it does become sort of a competition. You know, who can do the better job? Who can make sure that they're proposing what they want to propose for the next legislative session? And I would hope Governor Walz, and Governor Walz has been approached about this, would piggyback his state of the states with us so that if we're in one area of the state, he's going to be in one area of the state, he's going to give a state of the state, and we'll have parallel legislative proposals moving here. So that's what I'm hoping will happen. Now, again, that takes work. Well, will we be part of the planning? Yes. I suspect we'll be part of the budget, too. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? A lot to digest. Yes, Representative Gunther. I think I remember three, if not four, of these many sessions, and I never forget going to uh, Wilmer and seeing my first 48-pound turkey. <laughs> and uh, remembering the comment that we don't call these big birds, but small pigs. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it, it, the whole thing was very, very eventful. I remember certain things. Uh, they had gangs in Wilmer at the time, and there were 1,700 youth felonies. And that caused a lot of things for the legislature to look at, that we helped correct those things. And it was very positive for Wilmer and very positive for all of us. Madam Chair, Rep. Sam Gunther, the, the feedback on this, and you can see it when you read the legislative uh, session reports, is, is almost unanimously good. You know, the partisanship comes in and everyone's going to pick a little bit. But when, you, when you're talking to the people in the community, there is a great deal of pride in this. Oh, yeah. they, they want to show off, and they will show off, and that's what we need to do. We need to see them at their best and also when they need help. What are the needs? And it's much easier to understand them locally than it is just through testimony up here. And I, I say this with the chamber lobbyist in back of me, I hope. We don't need lobbyists for this. We're on site now. It's going to be the legislators and the community setting this up, not the lobbyists. Just to make a comment as well, as I look around at the committee membership here, we have um, maybe a little bit of representation from uh, metropolitan areas, but for the most part, uh, we are Greater Minnesota representatives. And um, this is our opportunity, I think, to showcase our parts of the state that perhaps people don't always come to. We come to St. Paul. We're here, you know, for 
weeks on end, months on end, but uh, for them to come to our areas for a few days sounds like a really positive thing to showcase. So appreciate the opportunity to hear about it today. And Madam um, Chair, just one other point. Representative Plum. We have some, a lot of first termers in the legislature. Notice that the uh, first termer in this presentation, that Representative Pulowski, he was also in his first term. You can do a lot in your first term. It takes a lot of work. Uh, uh, Representative Liz Lagarde. I would just, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to make a comment. Thank you so much um, for, for doing this because to truly understand something, you need to see it, feel it, and touch it. And by us going out there and having the opportunity to showcase across the whole state, I think it helps as legislators for all of us to get a feel from different parts of the state. So I think uh, this is wonderful and I truly embrace it. So thank you. And Madam Chair, next week we have the history of Chapter 12A and 12B of how we deal with natural disasters. It's going to be a similar presentation. This one, though, is going to be a little bit more serious. So next week, that's also in this committee. And we have drained the account for disasters. So we're going to discuss what we need to do and what we need to do to help Minnesota when there are natural disasters. So there'll be a similar presentation. All right. I believe this is the agenda for today. So if there's no other comment or questions. Uh, yes, Representative Lehman. Um, Madam Chair, Representative Pulowski. Um, with your teaching background, I'm just a little concerned that we're all going to maybe receive grades at the end of our session. <laughs> Madam Chair, Representative, your grade comes in the next election, and it's high stakes. So whether you win or lose, I pay close attention to what I'm presenting. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, uh, Representative Pulowski, and um, meeting adjourned.